Okay, well, thank you for coming. Welcome to Reunions 2013. Is everybody having a good time? Does the fact that you're here mean that you did not have a good time last night or you're just willing to push through the pain to come in this morning? All right, I'm seeing a lot of smiles. That's good. So um, I'm Cindy Reynolds, and I professionally work with the uh, Health System Development Office. I'm a fundraiser for the School of Medicine. And in that capacity, as well as in the capacity of friendship, I know Myla Goldman very well, but this morning is my first day to meet John Locke. And so Reunions 2013 is benefiting me as well as you. So that's, that's fantastic. We have a student volunteer helping us this morning. Her name is Erin, and you probably met her when you came in. And I want to thank her for hauling herself in here this early this morning, too. Um, big thanks to Myla and John for what you're about to hear. Uh, I think I already reminded you to silence your cell phones, but we did have one or two arrivals, so if you came in after I said that, please join the rest of us and silence your cell phones. There is a feedback evaluation card on the table right outside the door, and if you would give us some feedback after this talk, it helps us decide what to do next year and also give some feedback to the audience. Um, we are podcasting this morning, so your questions will be recorded. Please wait for the microphone. You'll raise your hand. We'll run around and bring you the microphone. And if you don't wait for the microphone, we'll ask our speakers to restate the question. And if they don't, we'll say, please restate the question. And then they will. So just to let you know. Um, also, we want to thank the Lifetime Learning Program in the Office of Engagement and the Alumni Association and in partnership, they are offering this seminar this morning. And both of those groups have just been fantastic getting Reunions 2013 off and running. So our speakers this morning are John Locke and Myla Goldman. And John is a professor and chair of electrical and computing engineering at the University of Virginia. He received the BS degree in science in Technology and Society from Stanford, and the MS and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from UCLA. He joined the UVA faculty in 2000. He is a senior member of the IEEE and is a former associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Computers and the IEEE Transactions on Computer-Aided Design of Integrated Circuits and Systems. I'm impressed. Sounds pretty good. He is a co-founder and steering committee for the Wireless Health Conference Series and is a co-founder and co-director of the UVA Center for Wireless Health. He's been the PI or co-PI on over 30 grants and has published over 100 refereed papers, including three best paper awards. His primary research interests include wireless health, body sensor networks, embedded systems, and digital system design methodologies. And he's joined by Myla Goldman. And Dr. Myla Goldman received her medical, de medical degree from Rush Medical School in Chicago, Illinois, in 1999. She then completed her neurology training at the University of Virginia. <laughs> Yay for you. In 2003, she began her three-year clinical neuroimmunology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation Mellon Center. During this time, she also completed a Master of Science degree in Clinical Research and Trial Design at Case Western Reserve U University in Cleveland, Ohio. She joined the faculty of the University of Virginia in the Department of Neurology in August 2006. Currently, she is the director of the James Q. Miller MS Clinic. Her research interests include outcome measures in multiple sclerosis, specifically tools to measure ambulation. And if she ever tricks you and tells you that you want to be a control in a six-minute walk study and you think that means you're going to walk for six minutes, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn over the pres um, presentation to John. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. <laughs> So gosh, you're filling out evaluations. This is like the teaching evaluations that you do, that all of our students do at the end of the semester that, that uh, chairs and deans review. So now, now, now it's made me, made me nervous. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, I, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, one, because um, it gives me an opportunity to tell people who are associated with UVA, who went to UVA, how great UVA is and how UVA has enabled me to do the kinds of things uh, in my research that I probably wouldn't be able to do very many places in this world because it is such a special place. 
Um, and, uh, but also because it gave me an opportunity to work with my friend Myla. Um, so when they, and they asked me about, about doing this talk, and they said, now do you want to talk with one of your physician collaborators? And I said, yes, yes, I want to talk with Myla. And so we had fun putting this, uh, this presentation together, and we hope that you have fun uh, listening to it. So this is sort of the formal, you know, somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat uh, stodgy title to our talk. But what we're really telling you about today is a story of when Myla met John. Um, so, uh, so we're going to be kind of taking you through the story of how we met, just like in When Harry Met Sally. Um, so Myla is going to start off by telling you about multiple sclerosis, which is her area of specialty, as you heard. And, uh, and she's going to tell you about the work that she did before she met me. And then I'm going to talk, talk to you about what I do and, all, and the kind of work that I did before I met Myla. And then we'll talk about how once we met, we were able to do things together that we couldn't do individually. And that's sort of the, you know, the excitement of synergistic research. And it's the excitement of being at a place like UVA, wonderful, comprehensive university. You can walk in just about any direction on grounds and bump into somebody who's a world expert in something that you can have an interesting conversation about. And if you're really lucky, you can figure out how to actually work together. So we'll take you through that story, and you'll see how it sort of weaves together into the kinds of projects that Myla and I are working on together now. So, Myla. OK. So can you hear me? Yeah? OK. So I'm going to tell you uh, about multiple sclerosis and about my research um, in 19 minutes. So, um, <laughs> so this is going to go really fast, but we'll have an opportunity for uh, questions as well. And I'd like to um, thank John and the planning committee for the opportunity to come speak with you about something that is really important to me and that I feel passionate about. So let me see the best way. Okay, so multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis um, is a chronic um, inflammatory condition of the central nervous system. And we don't know the actual cause, but we think it occurs in people who have a genetic susceptibility. So there's something about their DNA that they got that puts them at risk. And then they're exposed to something along the way in their lifetime, and we haven't identified what that is. And that combination results in them expressing this disease. Um, so multiple sclerosis, um, it is thought to be that every hour someone in the U.S. is diagnosed and that it, uh, currently there are approximately 400,000 Americans affected with multiple sclerosis, 2.1 million worldwide. Um, it is most commonly diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 50 but can occur at any age. And so this occurs typically in women and men, but more often women, who are in the prime of their uh, lives personally, professionally, starting their family, starting their careers. Um, because of the genetic vulnerability, there is some family susceptibility. And because of this environmental piece that we don't understand, it's more common um, as you move away from the equator. <clears throat> so um, I always think it's um, perspective demanding to sort of take a survey. So what I'd like to do in this room is if you are one degree of separation from multiple sclerosis, so you or a family member or a, a friend, a college roommate, someone that you've known in your life has multiple sclerosis, raise your hand. Okay, and then keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, presumably it's the same person, but you can both raise your hands. Um, and just look around. Okay, so um, this is just a random sample. I was teasing you, yeah. Okay, we won't do any more of that, good. All right, so the central nervous system, so here's a picture of, uh, the, of the complete nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord here. These nerves, as they come out of your body, is what we refer to as the peripheral nervous system. And so a peripheral nervous system disease would be like carpal tunnel because that's happening in the nerve out here in your limb. The central nervous system is the central portion, brain and spinal cord. The central nervous system controls everything. Neurology is the best and most important and critical field in medicine. Remember that. <laughs> so the central nervous system controls everything. So it controls um, all of your special senses, your vision, your hearing, your speech, and then it controls all your movements. And the way that it works essentially is through wires that are insulated with what we call myelin. And these insulated wires create networks, and those networks communicate information. 
So when you have multiple sclerosis, the immune system targets the insulation, the covering, the myelin. And that destruction causes damage to the nervous system and also damage to the wires themselves, the axons. And this damage expresses itself in several ways. So under normal circumstances, when you send a message, it travels in a very efficient fashion. So you think to yourself, I want to pick up my water. And you pick up your water. In fact, you pick up your water before you even finish the thought, I want to pick up my water. Um, and hopefully you don't do what I do, which is actually say everything I'm thinking. You know, you'd probably just... Okay, so if you have multiple sclerosis and you have a disruption in that pathway, there's a delay in the signal that you see here. So this would be a loss of myelin. Or if you lose the axon altogether, that signal doesn't transmit, okay? And so because of this and because of the vast importance of the central nervous system, these individuals can suffer from symptoms involving every sphere of their sort of function. So they can have weakness, they can have fatigue, they can have tremor, dizziness, difficult with their walking, bowel and bladder trouble. Everything that the central nervous system controls can be impaired in this disease. And ultimately, it can affect their emotions and their thinking because those actually you know, live in the central nervous system as well. Those are complex functions, um, but they are housed in the central nervous system. They're not housed down here. Um, okay, so the disease itself um, is uh, expressed in several different ways for individuals. Some people have what we call relapsing remitting, where they have an episode of inflammation in their central nervous system. They have symptoms associated with that, but they get better and they do well for a period of time, and then they have another episode, and so on and so forth. Some individuals just slowly get worse over time, and we call that progressive disease. Um, and at some point, um, individuals eventually, even if they start off with a relapsing course, they will develop a progressive um, component of the disease where they're slow worsening over time. Okay, so why am I interested in, um, any questions about that? You with me? Because that was like a whole textbook in six minutes. You guys are... You're UVA grads, aren't you? <laughs> you guys are like a smart bunch. Yeah, all right, good. So why walking? So why is walking important in MS? So um, if you remember me telling you about the central nervous system controlling everything you do, and you think about for a minute um, the space between your brain and your legs, it's the biggest space, right? It's much longer than the space, I um, mean, that's represented here, than the space between your brain and your eye. So there's just more real estate. So there's more places to be affected. So if you have um, one hit to the functional system, to the network between your brain and your eye, you might be able to get, get by okay. But if you've got real estate here where you can have 15 hits to the same network that controls walking, you're going to see that impairment. So here's a representation of walking in MS over time. So this seven, which I've indicated here, um, represents wheelchair dependence, okay? So at the five-year time point, this is from onset of disease, only about 10% of people uh, require the use of a wheelchair. After 10 years, you start to see it creep up, and this is about 25% of people are wheelchair dependent um, after 10 years of diagnosis. And by 25 years, that's 50% of the population who have a diagnosis of MS are wheelchair bound. Okay, 25 years, you might think to yourself, 25 years is a long time. But remember that these people were diagnosed when they were 20, when they were 30. So now they may be 55 and they're wheelchair dependent. Now raise your hand if you're older than 55. I'm just kidding. Okay, good. <laughs> So, it, so this, this, you know, resonates, right? Because these people are younger than many of you here. I won't point out who's older than 55. Um, but they, they, are, they have lost the ability to walk. All right. So walking is important. And it makes sense that walking is important um, in everything that we do. And um, this is a slide talking about working. So in this slide, a one and a two are very minimal walking impairment. So you would not, I always say to my resident, if you're walking behind them in the grocery store, could you tell something was wrong with them? And um, the answer for this, in terms of category one and two, is no. 
So these people look normal in their walking, but they have self-understood, self-perceived differences in their walking that we can't quantify before Myla met John. Um, but yet, still, they have significant functional loss. So these are women and men. So this is after one, after having just undetectable difference in their walking that the patient is aware, um, only 50% are employed full time. Okay? And over here with the women, there's a lower percentage that were employed full time at diagnosis, and that may be because they were at home with their kids, because they were you know, 26, 30. Um, but there's a significant drop off as well in their ability to maintain full-time employment outside the home. So walking is really important to the individual, but it's also com important to the community in terms of our sort of um, functional health and, and thinking about work and all of those things. So loss of mobility is ultimately ubiquitous feature in MS. So everybody eventually has trouble with their walking. In a survey done, 40% of the population cross-sectionally at that time reported difficulty with their walking. This was done by the National MS Society. And 70% strongly agreed that the difficulty with their walking was the most challenging aspect of their MS. And um, individuals have reported that walking is the most valuable function, and it's tightly associated, as I've uh, demonstrated here, with their ability to remain functionally independent and also employed. So in my experience during fellowship, there was this disconnect. So patients would come in, and I would examine them, and I would have them do what we call the time 25-foot walk and have them walk um, 25 feet. And I would say, you look great. See you next year. Um, and they would say, but I can't walk as far as I used to walk. And I'd say, no, you look great. Um, I was young. And they'd say, no, Dr. Goldman, I'm telling you, I cannot walk as far as I used to walk. Like, I, I get to the fourth aisle of the grocery store, and I'm having trouble. And I'd say, huh, I don't have a way to measure that problem that you're describing to me. I can't detect it. So what do I do? So I... Um, and so I started to think about, you know, how I could detect that and what is going on here. And so there's a couple things that contribute to your ability to walk. So when I see you in the clinic and I have you walk 25 feet in an unobstructed, flat-surfaced hallway, that's not a true representation of what walking in the real world is like, especially if you've got kids and dogs and you're trying to get across a crosswalk before it turns red and all of these things. So there's the environment. Um, there's your perception about your ability to walk. So after you have a fall, people often become very afraid to walk, and that affects their ability to walk for fear of falling. And then there's all the other things that contribute to your walking, your weight, if you have back pain, other issues that contribute. So before I met John, it was... I was, I was so misguided. Before I met John, I was really interested in this thing called the six-minute walk. And I'd like to take a moment to publicly thank Cindy for actually being a control in my research. Um, apparently, she doesn't want to publicly thank me. But I would like to publicly thank her. All right. So the six-minute walk. So why the six-minute walk? So the six-minute walk was adapted from the 12-minute walk. It had been used in cardiology since... Um, the 1980s, and it was well known in other fields of medicine, and so I just took it and applied it to multiple sclerosis. Um, it appealed to me um, because we had a tremendous amount of research and experience with it. There were published guidelines on how to administer it. So one of the challenging aspects, and we're going to talk about this actually, in validating new technology or a new tool is to prove that it actually does what you say it does, that it does what you say it does in a repetitive, redundant, reliable fun function or fashion. So if I do it and then I have John do it, is it the same outcome on the same person? And then most importantly, from a regulatory standpoint, because the ultimate goal is to take these tools and apply them to therapeutics, right? Help us understand what medicines are helping people. And so from the FDA standpoint, they want to know that what you're measuring means something. That, it, that it's actually what we call clinically meaningful. So if I say, I found a difference, does the patient think that that difference has any relevance or that it's meaningful? Or if the patient says, I'm getting worse, and I say, well, not by my tool, then that tool's not helpful. 
Okay, so it's, it's partnering, it's marrying what the patient's experience is and our ability to detect it in a, in a reliable fashion. Yes, sir. Um, are you guys worried at all that the FDA is a lot less enamored with the six minute walk now, at least on the cardiology side? Who brought you? <laughs> um, yeah, so, <laughs> so I've actually been involved. So I, and because of my work, the six minute walk um, is now, I shouldn't actually be bragging about this because the FDA doesn't care. No, um, the six minute walk has now been used in three phase three large multinational, um, multi-center international national studies in multiple sclerosis as a secondary outcome measure. But we have faced challenges with the FDA. Um, and one of the challenges that we have faced with the FDA is this clinical meaningfulness issue. So we say the six minute, well, we're gonna get there. But basically we say the six minute walk measures all these things that are important and the FDA says, we'll prove it. Um, and so we're still working on that in neurology. Um, now, the other thing about the FDA that's interesting is the people in cardiology don't talk to the people in neurology. So I always tell the people in neurology, the cardiology guys at the FDA love the six minute walk. So don't make a liar out of me. Um, <laughs> no, they don't like it as a primary endpoint. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Yeah. And so those are issues that we face across the board. Yeah. Um, and I'd be happy to talk with you more about that. In my experience, I've been involved in several conversations with the FDA in trying to get them to think about this measure. All right. Um, so the measure does what I was hoping it would do, which is that it differentiates people with, uh, without multiple sclerosis and people with. And so this just shows you simply that these are healthy non-MS controls. These are MS individuals and that there's a difference in their walking. And when you break out the MS people based on their level of disability, we see that they walk less and less. So the distance they're walking is reduced. Um, Okay, so in my uh, work, I actually modified the six minute walk script. So I told individuals with MS to walk as fast and as far as they could. In cardiology, they tell them to stop and rest whenever they want because they're trying, they're, they're, they're potentially inducing you know, ischemia to the heart. So they don't wanna you know, have them have a MI and drop down on the ground there. Um, but here in MS, I don't care if my patients drop down on the ground, so because it's not life-threatening, um, and it actually teaches me something about their walking. Um, so we have them. I'm totally kidding. We have them walk as far and as fast as they can, and I found that it was reliable, that it was feasible. So even individuals with advanced walking impairment from MS could do this, um, and that it offered several advantages over our current measures. Specifically, that it was a longer test, so it's sort of um, parallel to this analogy of walking in the grocery store. You know, could they walk past the fourth aisle instead of only measuring them in aisle one where a lot of people look good. Um, and other people have picked up and looked at this research as well and they have found that it does correlate to habitual walking performance. So if you measure how much people are walking out in their community using technology that we're going to talk about, the six minute walk does correlate to that. Um, and it correlates to their ability to do daily activities, to bathe themselves, feed themselves, all of these things. And it also relates to both the physician and the patient's perception of change. So I was feeling pretty good about myself. Um, but then the FDA didn't like it. Um, so what did we learn? So, so we wanted to understand more about this. And so this is a slide showing you minute by minute performance in the six minute walk. So normal people, if you say to them, Walk as far and as fast as you can. And during the walk, you say you've walked for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and then at the, at the last minute you say you have one minute left. What do you think people do? They walk really fast, right? Because we all have this innate competitive nature to us. And so normal people walk really fast. Now individuals with mild MS, they try to walk really fast, but they don't actually surpass their sprint out, their start time in the last minute. And that was very interesting to me. So they want to, but for some reason they can't. Okay, they can't mirror this exactly. And then the more disabled you get, the you just sort of teeter off over time. But it's unclear sort of what's driving this um, in terms of, of the walk function. So there are a lot of challenges to measuring walking 
in individuals with MS. Um, there's a lot of variability. So you remember those graphs I showed you of relapsing, remitting, and progressive. So where are they in their disease um, affects it. You remember me talking about all the different aspects that can be impaired. So is someone's walking affected because they don't have good coordination in their leg? Is someone's walking affected because they're weak? Is someone's walking affected because their vision is not normal? Is someone's walking affected because they have dizziness? And if their walking is affected by one or multiple factors, how does that play out? So just knowing how far somebody walks doesn't actually tell you how well somebody walks. And that is, um, and that is uh, where I was lucky to meet John. All right. OK, so as uh, this is sort of the second phase of the, of the story that we're telling here, what have I been doing in the years leading up to when, uh, when John met Mylon? So um, you're going to see from this slide um, how, uh, how when, when Myla and I ultimately did meet, how it was just you know, this wonderful synergy. So 10, 12 years ago or so, I, uh, I, um, the person who was my chair at the time, who's now my dean, um, said, you know, John, you're, you're, you're at UVA, you're a wonderful comprehensive university, like I was saying before. And, you're, but, and you're, you're doing great stuff, sort of keeping your head down, doing the electrical engineering thing. But go and talk to people. Maybe you'll find some really interesting opportunities uh, to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries. Take advantage of being at a place like UVA. So I did that. I started walking in all the different directions on grounds. Ended up over at the medical school and nursing school and psychology department quite a bit. And the thing I heard time and time again was the challenge of data collection. Right? I mean, so if you think about how medicine works, right, and, and people trying to make decisions, whether it's medical research or it's a clinical diagnosis or you're, or you're trying to determine how well a new therapeutic drug or physical therapy is working, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to actually measure that. And you heard Myla talk about some of those things specifically with respect to MS. But I heard this in so many different fields of medicine that sort of at the two extremes, you have inpatient monitoring, right? So inpatient monitoring, you can be hooked up to the most high-tech equipment in the world. I mean, MRIs and ECG machines and all these kinds of things. It's really incredible how high-tech and that the quality of data that you get from that is extraordinarily high. It's also extraordinarily expensive. It's very inconvenient for the patients to come in and be hooked up to these machines. And here's a really big one, and it relates to what Milo was talking about. You're only getting a snapshot of how you're doing at that moment that you're hooked up to the machine. It's not necessarily representative of how you're doing in day-to-day -day life, okay? especially in diseases where symptom severity fluctuates. On the other end of the spectrum, you have patient self-reports, right? where you have um, uh, the, the patients basically saying, you know, here's how I'm doing. And, and, and Myla talked about that. And there can be this disconnect between what somebody is observing in the cl clinic and what somebody is self-reporting. But of course, when somebody self-reports, it can be really challenging. I mean, it's hard to be quantitative. One of my, one of my most frustrating experiences when I go to the doctor is I, I say something hurts. And they say, to, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much does it hurt? How am I supposed to answer that question, right? You know, I, I, like I want them to calibrate me, you know, you know, pinch me and then punch me, tell me that's a 3 and a 7, and I'll tell you about how much this hurts. I mean, so it's really hard to get good, accurate, quantitative self-report data. Well, you know, if it's, it's in, the in the name of science, hit me. Um, so, uh, you know, just in having these kinds of discussions, we really wanted something that could give the best of both worlds. High quality data captured continuously, remotely over an extended period of time. Now, that's this concept of wireless body sensor networks to do all of this. Now, 10, 12 years ago, when I started having these conversations with people uh, all across grounds, um, there was something happening in the engineering world as well. These low power microcontrollers and wireless transceivers and Bluetooth and, uh, and, and miniature sensors, all these kinds of things started to come, become available. So there's this opportunity to say, OK, if I can combine those various pieces of technology together and design wireless sensors that can be worn on the body, right? hopefully pretty low power, hopefully pretty small, then I can potentially, potentially collect high quality data continuously anywhere. Okay, So that then, over the past 
10 or 12 years, has led to this vision. And this is now a whole field. In fact, that phrase, body sensor networks, did not exist 12 years ago. Uh, wireless health, M health, mobile health, pervasive health, those kinds of words weren't around 12 years ago. But this is the vision now that we're working with, where we can put sensors on somebody's body, collect that data continuously, and get it where it needs to go. Now, so there's a hardware aspect of this. You know, as an electrical engineer, I'm going to be building these sensors, the electronics and the power management and the wireless communication, all those kinds of things. Um, there's the software part of it, and this is actually a really big challenge where we are able to collect all this raw sensor data. We're really good at that now, but then trying to convert that data into medically relevant information, clinically relevant, as Mila said. There's a really huge challenge there, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, then databases, thinking about how all of this new kind of data that we're collecting works in things like electronic medical record systems. How's all that going to work? And then trying to link all these things together so it's really a cohesive, efficient system rather than just a set of individual components. Now, it was interesting, too, when I started having those conversations, I was talking to the doctors and the nurses and the psychologists saying, what, you know, basically, what data can I get to them to help them do their job better? And then I started talking to the patients themselves. And I, would, I was telling them this story. And they said, well, wait a minute. What information can you give back to me where I can control my own health better? I can learn more about myself, which became a really, really interesting concept and has, has led to this uh, notion of the quantified self and biofeedback and these kinds of things where people can be more in control of their own health. How many people have actually looked at their own medical chart when you go to the doctor, it seems like it's this hidden thing, right? I mean, why don't we know more about ourselves? Well, these kinds of technologies give us the opportunity to do that. So the big questions that come up. So hopefully I've sold you on the concept, right? And when I started talking to uh, people in these various fields, I mean, you know, I got all really excited about it. And so the answer to this first big question in this space of what value does this wireless health paradigm promise? And it's, you know, all the things that, you would, that I was talking about, right? And lowering healthcare costs, by the way, is a really big aspect of this too, of course. Um, the second question that's much more challenging, and it actually relates to the discussion that the two of you are having of proving, is how do we actually demonstrate this value, right? As an engineer, what do I have to do? If I'm building these systems, what do I have to do? Well, the very first thing I need to do is talk to people who actually know what they're doing in this space. I'm an electrical engineer. My last biology class was freshman year in high school. I can't pretend that I know what I'm doing with respect to multiple sclerosis. That would be a joke. So I need to collaborate, okay? And I need to collaborate a lot. And I need to, you know, I need to try to plant a lot of seeds, and hopefully a couple of them will sprout into, into meaningful collaborations. Um, I need to deploy the technologies we're developing on real people. I'll talk about the importance of that. I already mentioned converting the data to medically relevant information, um, using appropriate metrics. So as I'm optimizing my system, I can say, I'm going to get this system to be as low power as possible so my battery life can be as long as possible. Well, if I'm doing things there that are potentially you know, creating loss or distortion of the data that results in a misdiagnosis just because I'm trying to optimize the power in my system, that's obviously a bad thing. And then science-based research, where we actually have to do real studies and evaluate statistical significance and all these things. We have to do this the right way if we really are going to show places like the FDA that these things are doing what, we're, what we say that they're doing. So there are huge challenges associated with this. Interdisciplinary research for anybody who's done it is an enormous challenge, but this is where all the rewards are too. Okay, this is where we can really do something meaningful. So as a result of that, um, about four years ago, we, we established the UVA Center for Wireless Health. Um, and, and, I, and I came up with this tagline, and I, I'm still like to pat myself on the back for it because I, I think it's really important. So an interdisciplinary, it's an interdisciplinary team of research focusing on technology to improve healthcare. That's everything that I've said so far. But the second part is, real, is an important realization for an engineer, and healthcare to improve technology. Basically what that means is that we can create this technology, sure, and we can probably market, probably get a lot of people to buy it. But it's, the, we need to, but it's through our collaborations and through our real deployments on real patients that we learn so much about what these technologies really need to be. What are the real requirements of these technologies? Right? If we created these things in a vacuum, they wouldn't do what we wanted them to do. So there's that feedback, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. So I founded this, uh, this center four years ago with, with two of my, of my colleagues in the engineering school, but then we have these members from all these different fields of medicine and psychology and nursing, et cetera. Now, my specific group, 
Um, as, as was said during my introduction, I'm, I'm an embedded systems person, which is, means that I you know, design these kinds of systems for a variety of applications. Um, we, we, we design the circuits, we do the wireless communication, we do the signal processing to extract the information. Um, but we, all, we do that all within the context of these real medical applications. So we try to build real systems for real clinical applications, and we use what's called a rapid prototyping cycle, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, our focus, just with, and this was just, I mean, it, it's, it's a good application for us, but it was also mostly because those are the little seeds that grew when I started talking to people 12 years ago relating to movement disorders. Where, um, and I'll talk about one of the first examples that we had there, where we can use wearable sensors for high precision motion capture, and then when we process that, get some information about how somebody is moving. So multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, we can talk about all these kinds of things here. And we can do it you know, for all the goals that I mentioned. Now, from a technology perspective, we're, you know, as I said, we're trying to maximize wearability. We want these things to be really small and have a long battery life while providing the high quality data that's required. Of course, in, but then the goal is that we want to actually improve healthcare, lower healthcare costs, improve patient outcomes, improve quality of life, all of those kinds of things, and we want to demonstrate this, right? I mean, so I think academics, especially engineers, sometimes have this habit of saying, well, we built it, and we, and we sort of did some initial testing in the lab, and it seems like it worked, write a paper about it, and I'm done, and I'm moving on. Now, we can't stop there if we're really going to end up having an impact on this field. So our approach to all of this, and this goes back to the tagline for the Wireless Health Center um, in ter terms of using the technology to in, in, uh, using healthcare to improve the technology, is that we have to go through this cyclical approach um, to ensure that, our, that, the that, the, that the technologies that we're developing are converging on the right set of application requirements, specifications, those kinds of things. We need to make sure that we're building the right things. And we have to figure out how to do that. I mean, that's, that's a real challenge. When Myla and I did finally meet, she didn't say, here's exactly what I want. Here's exactly the system that I need. It was, well, there's some opportunities here. Well, let's build something and try it out and then use our experience from that to improve. So that led us to this body sensor network research cycle. And I'm going to take you through a couple of iterations of this, where we have a clinical application. We try to figure out, well, what kind of information would we want would actually be helpful for that application then using that to figure out what it is that we actually need to build and how to optimize that, and then we actually need to build it, and then we have to try it out. We have to deploy it in that clinical application and go round and round. Okay, so let me take you through a real quick iteration of this, and it's for one of the first applications that we ever targeted. It was working with some people in neurosurgery, Jeff Elias and Bob Freisinger, and they wanted to study the efficacy of deep brain stimulation for tremor control and Parkinson's disease in essential tremor patients. Deep brain stimulation is this unbelievable thing. It's like a pacemaker for your brain, where they actually put the electrodes in your brain, and then they stimulate different parts of the brain at different frequencies, different voltages, duty cycles, all those things. And they're hopefully then going to be able to control tremor from that. Um, but the problem is that, that, that they had was one of data collection. Right? They could see visually that a certain setting of the stimulator was helping a patient. And they could have the patient maybe like pour some water or something like that and see if they could do simple activities of daily living. But they didn't really have a quantitative way to evaluate tremor severity. So that was a real challenge for them as they tried to, as they tried to, tr uh, to study this. For D-drain stimulation, again, you can see those electrodes in the brain to stimulate different parts of the brain at different frequencies, all of that kind of stuff. So that's what they, that was what they were doing, and they wanted a better way to quantitatively and precisely assess tremor severity. So that was our clinical application, and they wanted continuous non-invasive non -invasive tremor measurement. And oh, by the way, the continuous part of it was really important because for anybody who knows people, somebody with Parkinson's disease or essential tremor, is that tremor severity can change a lot from day to day, even hour to hour. So if somebody's in the clinic being evaluated, just like I was talking about before, their tremor severity at that time can be very different than it is when they're outside the clinic, especially when you start thinking about white coat syndrome, right? When people are in front of a doctor and they start to get nervous and they have different kinds of symptoms. So that was sort of the idea of, could we do something that enable this continuous non-invasive tremor measurement? 
So we had to think then, well, what kind of information would we really want that would actually be helpful for this? And we realized that there was this notion of a joint time frequency analysis of motion. I won't get into the, the mathematical details of what that means, but, but this was, you know, again, developed in collaboration with the people in neurosurgery. So what was it that we really wanted to build? Well, we had this then concept of wearable inertial sensing nodes. So inertial, in this case, I'm talking about accelerometers and gyroscopes, things that you can actually see how people move. And then we said, okay, well, now we actually need to build this thing. And as I was saying before, I mean, you know, so even though we had talked about these, and we had several meetings talking about what it, what it was that we wanted, if at that point in time we had said, okay, we'll go and build it, we'll work on it for a couple of years, we'll, we'll build something, it'll be really sleek, really low power, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll try it out, almost certainly we would have wasted our time because there's no way that we knew exactly what to build. Right? We, we needed to build something quickly, try it out, learn from that experience, and then iterate. So that's this notion of prototyping, where we can build something quickly, try it out, and then keep on going through this loop, iterating on this process. Okay? So this was version one of what is our tempo system. So this is our wearable motion capture system. It was this big clunky thing, it was really ugly, it was really, really hard to use, but it worked. We could actually put it on real patients and collect real data and learn from that experience. And then over time, we got it down to this Tempo 3, which we'll show you here in a minute. Uh, provides six degrees of freedom motion capture, so X, Y, Z of acceleration and roll, pitch, and raw of yaw of rotation. In a form factor of a wristwatch, there's a Bluetooth transceiver in here, so we can wirelessly stream the data to a, you know, a cell phone or a laptop or whatever it is. Where we're heading in the future is to integrate all of this onto a single piece of silicon. Okay? So this is a die photo here from one of my colleagues in electrical and computer engineering, Ben Calhoun, where he has the capability with this chip to do a two-lead ECG with some circuitry that can detect atrial fibrillation and can wirelessly stream all the ECG data, and it can do that at 19 microwatts. Well, what's 19 microwatts? That, I mean, how am I supposed to know what that is? Well, it's low enough that we can run it purely off of body heat. We can actually take the heat that your body generates, convert that into electrical charge. Now, we can't generate that much of it. I mean, we don't get a, you know, we aren't charging a big battery off of that, but it's enough to power this circuit. So we're working in this direction. We're gonna have these tiny little sensors just these miniature things, like the size of a grain of rice, that we can put on your body that can run forever without a battery. That's where we're headed. Okay, so my, uh, my, uh, my, one of my PhD students here, Shan Shan Chen, had agreed to come and help us today so she could do, we could do a quick demo of our Tempo system. You can see here, this is that wristwatch form factor. Uh, um, it's still pretty ugly, we're still working on it, but uh, you can see here that um, we have, let's see, which node do we have here? So, uh, that's real-time streaming of the tempo data. There are six streams that you can see there, and those for, are for the six different sensors, X, Y, Z of acceleration and roll, pitch, and raw, roll, pitch, and yaw of, of rotation. And uh, so we're able to wirelessly stream this data using this kind of technology. We also have versions where you can write to local flash memories, so we can collect the data over a really, really long time and then just download it later. Depending on our application, you know, do we need real-time streaming or can we, can we, uh, can we store and, and, and analyze later? Thanks, Sean Sean. People can play with that later if you like. Okay, so we tried this then. You know, we, so we, we built Tempo and we put it on real people. Okay, so let me talk real quickly about, about, about some of the applications that we've done. This is all, again, before I met Myla. But you can see where this is all leading, right? You can see how this story is coming together of, of it was kismet when, 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 when Myla met John. Okay, so we've done, we've, this is an ugly slide, I know, but I just want to create this list of some of the different human subject studies, IRB approved, real, you know, real deal, real medical study stuff, which is pretty exciting for an electrical engineer whose last biology class was freshman year in high school, um, uh, where, where we've used Tempo, okay? And I'm gonna go through just a couple examples of this. The first one, I'll take you back, uh, going back to the deep brain stimulation project. There's Tempo 1, this ugly thing, it wasn't even wireless, okay? But that's a real Parkinson's disease patient who had deep brain stimulator implanted, and we were able to use that to collect data and to figure out how to process the data to turn that into quantitative assessments of tremor severity. We've, uh, one of the big things that we do is assess fall risk. We look at how people walk. Okay, again, we're gonna be tying back to Myla here in a second. Look at how people walk and see if they're at a higher risk for falling. This specific study was looking at patients on dialysis. 
Patients who are on dialysis fall at a much higher rate than patients who aren't on dialysis. Why? Well, nobody knew. So we tried to figure that out, we, and, and it was actually something that was a result of the dialysis session. So they would fall at a higher rate for the 24 hours after dialysis, and then from that 24 hours to their next dialysis session, they didn't fall at a higher rate than the rest of the population. So something about the dialysis was causing them to fall more. Nobody understood why. So we collected gate data before and after dialysis sessions and said, what's different, and got some interesting results from that. We also do that on, on the general geriatric population as well. We work with assisted living facilities to see if we can detect people who are at fall risk so we can intervene before a fall occurs. We don't want to wait until they've fallen. Another really exciting project that we have is with some people in orthopedic surgery where we're trying to improve orthopedic devices for children with cerebral palsy. So we're doing that by embedding sensors into the orthopedic devices themselves so that when they wear the, these orthopedics home, we can actually get data continuously for how effective it actually is. So those are just a few examples of what we've done sort of on the, on the clinical application side and the kind of information that we're able to generate with our sensors. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you super quickly about, this is a little bit of the engineering side of it, for system optimization, for actually making these systems more efficient. So as I was saying before, we want these things to be as small as possible, long as possible battery life, while still providing high quality data. Well, here's an example of a way that we do that. Power consumption of that tempo node right there, wirelessly streaming all of the raw sensor data, all the sensors on, operating in the highest fidelity mode. Battery life is about, excuse me, is about five hours. That's fine for some of our applications. It's not for others. So what do we do? Are there any engineers in the room? All right, okay, great. Well, <laughs> Sean John, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is why we create pie charts, right? We look at the power consumption of the system, and we say, where can we have our biggest impact? Look at the biggest pieces of the pie. Well, that blue piece on the right is the wireless transceiver. That light blue piece on the left is the gyroscopes. Those are consuming our most power. So what can we do in order to reduce the power consumption of this system and extend the battery life? Well, we can try to transmit fewer bits. If we try to process the data on the sensor node and compress it, we can use compression, te compression techniques like JPEG and zip files. You know, you know about compression. So we can do that, and, and so we can transmit fewer bits, save some, save some average power on the wireless transceiver side. Transmit only when necessary, maybe only when something interesting is happening, okay, instead of always transmitting all the raw data. Transmit information instead of data. Can we pre-process the data, right? And maybe that means transmitting fewer bits as a result. And then, of course, the gyroscopes, well, if, if, if the, like, for example, if we're using the gyroscopes to look at how somebody's walking, the gyroscopes don't need to be on when the person's not walking. We can use the accelerometers to detect whether or not the person's walking, and when they start walking, turn on the gyroscopes. Save a lot of power that way. Now, all this comes down to we need to make these sensor nodes more intelligent so that they can make these decisions and do dynamic power management. Okay? All right, so that takes us around this last little bit that, that uh, you know, this the cycle again here, and you can kind of see how all these things come together. Um, but the point here, before uh, we, we now, before we, we get to the, the, the exciting part of the story when, when Mila met John, is that, is to further emphasize how important the real clinical applications are to our work. I mean, I can, I can have a lot of fun in my lab, and we can build a lot of really cool stuff, but, you know, unless we have these real clinical applications to drive this cycle, then, then we're just, you know, then we're just you know, creating these really expensive little widgets that aren't really going to help anybody. So that's why then it was very exciting when Myla met John and John met Myla. Um, and so you can see from the two things that we talked about so far how you know, once we got to know what, what Myla did before she met John and what John did before he met Myla, that there was this perfect opportunity to start working together. This will be hot. <laughs> Am I back on? Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to remind you about a couple things that were um, questions that were sort of left. So remember this slide. So we wanted to understand a couple things. One is in the mild population, so in these individuals, why is it that they cannot get there in that last minute? What's happening? Is it something in the breakdown, in the dynamics of their walking? What's actually going on there? And then here, in this more advanced population, um, so sort of on both ends of the spectrum, are these people have dysfunctional gait and their dysfunctional gait is sort of static, but it's just their energy slows down? Or is there, again, sort of something that changes in their, in their walking? Um, and 
are the things that put you in these different groups relevant? So, um, you know, this is a disability score. So we characterize disability by giving it a number. But think about, like, if your disability is from tremor versus visual impairment, does that put you in a different group when we think about how well you walk? So does the part of the nervous system that's not normal actually affect how well you walk, as opposed to just putting everyone in one bucket because of how disabled we think they are? So is walking disability more complex than actual sort of general multiple sclerosis disability? And how do we begin to tease that out? Because that would be really important to understand, and does neurologic disability in one area affect your risk for fall, for example, okay? So there's so many pieces here that were not understood. So the way that I like to think about this is how. So if you just measure how fast someone walks or how far someone walks, and you measured house, so if you gave house a six minute walk, he would beat everybody in this room. And he would beat all of our probably um, healthy controls, right? This guy walks fast and he covers a lot of space when he walks, but his walking is profoundly abnormal, right? If you watched him walk at the grocery store, you would know something was wrong with him, um, unless in his real life he doesn't walk like that, but I digress. <laughs> so the point is clear, right? That measuring how far and how fast somebody walks doesn't necessarily tell you everything you need to know about how well that person walks. So as we sort of Talk, told each other our stories of how what we were doing before we met, we identified two clear opportunities um, and, and, and we've already kicked off some projects that we'll be telling you about for the rest of our talk. The first one is looking at higher precision in lab performance analysis. So adding tempo to the six minute walk. She was already doing the study, already recruiting the patients and doing the assessments that she was always already doing. We added tempo to that for higher precision analysis. We're able to look at how somebody walks, as Milo was saying. And then there's a second project that we are about to kick off, actually, um, that is looking more at the remote continuous assessment, where people are actually going to be wearing these kinds of technologies home, while at the same time doing online surveys, and we're going to be trying to study you know, how people really do out there in the real world. And I think, and we'll come back to this, but importantly, that partners the patient's experience from our science. So we think this is really cool. But in the real world, boots on the ground, are what we measuring, are, is what we are measuring related to what the patient is experiencing. Right. And that second project is looking to marry those two critical elements of scientific uh, outcome measures. And you can see how this all comes back to one of the important words in the title of this talk about personalized healthcare. We can start to do a better job figuring out the issues for each individual rather than treating somebody as a, as a data point on a statistical distribution. So one of the things that ends up being a really big issue in all of our studies, and certainly is rearing its head in the, in our, in the collaboration looking at the six minute walk, is that this be quickly becomes a big data problem. Some of you may have heard that buzzword recently of big data, collecting huge amounts of data, and what do you do with it? How do you actually turn that into useful information? So data to information, there are those six waveforms that you saw that stream from Tempo, how do we turn that into information? Okay. Well, there's two different techniques that we talked to you about. One are sort of these first principle models where we can get some features out of these signals. And the second is machine learning. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, some artificial intelligence kinds of techniques where, uh, where that, that can help us figure out what's going on with all of this data. So just to take a real quick snapshot of comparing MS gate to healthy gate. So these are just two different subjects. The blue is MS and the, and, the, um, and the red is a healthy control. And you can see that there are some qualitative differences there. Um, so the data that we're seeing, we're specifically looking at the gyroscope that's in the Z plane, which is the sagittal plane. So the sagittal plane is this plane. It's where most of the motion happens when you're walking. So we're looking basically at the rotation that's happening down at the ankle in the sagittal plane. And you can see that it looks different, in particular where the heel strikes occur. So you can see this big heel spike thing is happening with the MS subject that isn't happening with the healthy control. Okay, so that's an interesting difference that we can notice just by looking at the data. But this is sort of a qualitative type of difference. We really need to make this meaningful. Okay, so what are the relevant features, quantitative features that we can extract from this data? How can we extract those features automatically? Because it is this big data problem, collecting huge amounts of data. We can't look at it. We have to run algorithms that extract them. And then are these features clinically meaningful? That's what we have to find out, right? Otherwise, we're just having fun. 
Okay, so uh, just, you know, this is for the six minute walk for the, in, you know, for the higher precision in lab um, performance assessment. We look at a variety of different features. So if you think about gate features, some of the temporal features, double support time, single support time, I'll talk about those things in a, in a second, but then there's also these nonlinear features, some aspects of gate stability and complexity. And then once we are able to, once we extract all these features to use machine learning techniques to try to start making decisions, like diagnoses, for example, from, this ki from these kinds of features. Okay, so here is what one gait cycle looks like from the time that your right heel hits the ground to when it hits the ground again. So from the time that your right heel hits the ground, both feet are on the ground, right? And then you sort of rotate on that foot and then you do a left toe off. And that swings through and then left heel hits the ground while the right foot's still on the ground and so on, right? That's a gait cycle, okay? And you can see that there are different phases of this gate cycle here, double support time, all of that, and we can analyze these kinds of things. Very hard to do visually, but it's easy to extract from our kind of data. So we did this for a whole bunch of our subjects here. Control subjects, mild MS, moderate MS, for double support time, how much time they were spending with both feet on the ground. And you can think about how that might be important. If somebody's shuffling, both feet are on the ground most of the time, okay? And you can see that for the moderate MS, they generally had longer double support times. And then even when we normalized that by gait speed, it was still the case. So it wasn't just that they were walking more slowly, it's just that it actually as a percentage of their gait cycle was, was right, higher. So these are all people who walk as far in the six minute walk, but they're differentiated. So now, does that make sense? They yeah. cover the same distance in six minutes, but there's something different about them. Exactly, so, from, so, so before Mila met John, she wouldn't have, the data that she collected wouldn't have been able to tell the difference between these subjects. Because they would have all been in the same group. Mm -hmm. But using tempo, we can get this information. This is awesome! <laughs> <laughs> and, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and so we look at other features as well, and some of them don't, don't appear to be as fruitful. So we looked at aspects of gait stability, and there actually wasn't as much of a difference. We're not going to hit a home run with every single feature that we extract. But we got to try them and, and see, see what it tells us. And then doing for, for there's aspects of gait of gate complexity that were quite interesting, especially for the huge range of the control subjects, which basically means that even if you have official, if you don't have MS and you supposedly have a healthy gait, is that everybody still walks differently. So there's some interesting challenges there for when you're an analyzing these kinds of things. Okay, once we extract all these kinds of features, yes, please. And this goes back to that, if you remember that circle of walking, that there's comorbid conditions. So even though you don't have MS disability, if you have other health issues and we enroll you, your walking may be affected. And so that gets back to that circle of all the complexity that goes into just regular walking and regular and it's another challenge to doing mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. Exactly, yeah. How, how can you tell a difference between two people as being something that's clinically meaningful or they just walk differently, right? right? That's part of what we need to try to understand. So using machine learning techniques, what, what we can do is that, so, so, we, so, 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 so we had, um, so we had 26 subjects to the time that we were doing this analysis here. Um, there were eight control subjects, um, and, uh, and we basically, you know, extracted all these different features, and we would train the machine learning technique on 25 of the subjects, basically trying to say, you know, what these different features mean based on what the diagnosis is, and then try to diagnose the last one. Right, so that's, that's one of the techniques that we're looking at here. And we end up create, coming up with this matrix where the ground truth said that 18 of the subjects had MS and four of them, and, 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 um, and, and eight of them were healthy controls. But when we put it into our machine learning technique, it turned out that we had some, some you know, we, we had some misdiagnoses. So two people who actually had MS, our machine learning said that they were controls, and four people who, who were healthy controls, our system is diagnosed as, as MS. Obviously, this is not good, um, so we need to be working on this, right? But this is why this is research. I mean, didn't Einstein say if we, were, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research? Um, so anyway, but so this is an ongoing project. We're recruiting more subjects. We're extracting more features. We're trying to do better and better, and we're looking at different ways to make this all clinically meaningful. And I think going back, mm -hmm. if you think about this is on, you know, 26 people, I mean, imagine if we had 100 people. I mean, this is still pretty impressive if you think about it 
based on the number of people. So we are getting at some very distinct differences in terms of um, just differentiating these groups. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the project. So, um, so that is the what 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 John just talked about is the first piece of it, which is um, just implementing the technology in this population, putting these sensors on people with MS and figuring out what we can use the sensors to help us understand. Um, and then the second thing that we wanted to do was to bring together what we thought was important and scientifically different and partner it with what patients were reporting. Because that's the piece that I was still trying to get at when I, before I met John, um, was doing the six minute walk. Okay, now I'm, my did you hear all that? Yeah. I don't need to repeat it? The podcast listeners didn't. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> Sorry. okay. Um, well, they should have been here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this is just getting back at that point that I was making, and I'll make it again for those that are on the podcast. So what we wanted to understand is we saw this difference scientifically and using this technology. For example, this is one example, is that heel strike differential between individuals with MS and individuals uh, who did not have a diagnosis of MS. And that there was something really there that separated out the population. Um, and I always, like even my mom could look at this and tell these are different. Um, I say that a lot, but she is an intelligent woman. My <laughs> residents all think like, what, what's the deal with your mom? But what we want to know is, um, are these clinically meaningful? So do, what does this mean? And again, getting back to this, what's happening out in the real world? So these people are walking six minutes in a hallway, flat surface. You know, we put cones to protect them. They have a walking lane. You know, this is all very, um, it's better than having them walk 25 feet, in my opinion. Um, but it's not the real world. It's not a dog walking under their feet. It's not transitioning from grass to sidewalk. It's not going up a hill or upstairs. It's not all of these things. It's not walking while talking, right? So if you have MS and you are trying to walk and talk on your cell phone, it turns out that's hard. Because, um, you know, the brain is uh, affected in even these complex tasks. Um, and there's a group that I collaborate with at the University of Illinois who is um, challenging patients to walk while counting, subtracting seven from 100. You know, it turns out they don't walk as good. So all of these things are going into it. So w texting while walking is just as dangerous as texting while driving. I don't know if you guys have experienced that. Okay. Cue laughter. <laughs> um, all right, so what are we doing? So what we are doing is looking at um, the, marrying these two things. So the first thing is measuring mobility. So we want to expand our understanding about this technology. So we're looking at a couple different devices and we're putting them on individuals with MS. We're having them wear them out in the community once a month for six months and capturing information about how much they're walking in their everyday life, in their environment, integrating all the elements that we um, talked about. We're gonna have them wear tempo during the six minute walk to get at that fine tuned characterization of their walking in a controlled way. Um, and so there's three different devices that we're using to look at this. One is the tempo that we've been teaching you about and then there's some other outpatient devices that we're looking at and part of the thing here that we want is to look at the generalizability of, of some of these things. So um, John's wearing his Fitbit today. Fitbit is a common technology that you can buy and wear. Um, I don't do it because I don't want to know. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, John's braver than I. And then the second piece is correlating that to the, to the experience. So we're looking at our current clinical measures. So do I think the patient is changing in all the ways that I routinely measure that individual? Does the patient think that they're changing? Specifically, do they think that their walking is any different? And do other things affect whether or not their walking is changing? So maybe the patient doesn't think that their walking is any different, but we see a difference in this technology. What does that mean? Well, is the patient reporting more pain? Is the patient reporting more fatigue? Is it a bad vision day for the patient? So maybe they don't think their walking's changing, but what else is happening over here that could explain a change that we see in the technology? So the individuals, the patients, um, are going to be answering surveys once a month 
at the same time that we're capturing how much they're walking out in the community, and they're going to do that uh, once a month for six months. And um, one of uh, the um, uh, engineering grad students um, who uh, put together this uh, web interface, um, which has been a tremendous accomplishment to me, I can't even answer my email, um, and he built this. So, um, so I just think it's really neat. I wanted to show you this. So the patients will sign on to here, and they will be required to sign on once a month, but they can sign on as frequently as they would like. So they could sign on every day. And we're doing a 50, uh, I guess, 10,000 foot view um, of how they're feeling every time they sign on. We have, um, specific, um, we have specific surveys that we're asking them to complete, and they'll have to complete these every month, but they can um, complete them um, as frequently as they would like. And then they themselves can go in and look at their data. So this comes back to this sort of feedback and helping patients understand what's going on with them. And so the patients can go in and say, well, how many bad days have I had? And how does that relate to what's going on with me? And they can get graphs of their own symptom tracking. So, um, so what we've hoped is that we've been able to share with you how important this synergy is and all of the things that we are now able to do together that we were not able to do when we were functioning independently. Um, and you know, I think that this really talks and speaks to one of the amazing things about the University of Virginia is that there are sort of great people at multiple levels across the institution. And it, you know, we're not just thriving in one area, but the university is thriving in all these different schools, in the School of Medicine, in the School of Engineering, and that there is a mechanism for us to come together and do this work. Um, and that we're close. Um, you know, where I grew up in Chicago, you know, there are, uh, there are schools where the School of Medicine is actually 15 miles away from the School of Engineering. So one of the other neat things about UVA is the proximity of all of this in, um, activity in science. Um, and so what we are hoping is that this uh, machinery is going to help us understand this machinery. So thank you for your attention. Not, uh, add, oh yes, there you go. Uh, thank you very much. You've told a fantastic story, and I can't wait for the diner scene. In, <laughs> right. uh, the two of us are very interested in the aspect of enhancing wellness and enabling aging in place in the general um, senior population. And as you were talking, I couldn't help, before you even mentioned the Fitbit, look at the similarities at least at the surface between your Tempo 3 and devices that are generally wearable and freely available. So I was wondering if you'd been doing any work or any of the work that you are doing can be translated uh, into a consumer-based product for caregivers and even indivi uh, aging individuals themselves. Absolutely. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and um, so, uh, so a couple of different aspects of that is that we actually do work with a lot of companies. Um, some are small startups. In fact, two of my former PhD students who were instrumental in developing Tempo and building up the Center for Wireless Health are now in Northern Virginia. They've started a company that is a home health monitoring system. It, it, the company is called Be Close. You can go to beclose.com, B-E-C-L-O-S-E. -E. And it's basically in-home sensors so that if you have like an elderly parent still living alone at home, you can actually monitor their activities remotely and, and see if everything's okay. You can set alerts if the front door opens at 2 a.m. You can get an automatic phone call. Um, you know, there's, there are those kinds of, you know, aging in place types of technologies. We also work with larger companies. I work with Philips Healthcare. I work with GE Medical and Intel and companies like that that are developing these kinds of technologies for, for these applications. Um, you mentioned something that I think is really, really important. I've gotten more and more involved with um, the sort of caregiver empowerment side of all of this. So we're actually doing a study right now with some people in geriatric nursing that is um, helping to uh, detect and ultimately prevent episodes of um, physical and, and verbal agitation in dementia patients who are living at home. So 
caregiver burden is a really, really huge thing for if you have a loved one with, with dementia and you're trying to care for them still at home. Um, and dealing with agitation episodes actually is the number one reason why somebody then ends up transitioning that loved one from home to a care facility. And so we're trying to detect what causes agitation. We're trying to detect agitation at the very early stages before it ramps up into something severe and provide that information back to the caregivers to empower them to hopefully end up pre pre you know, prevent and better deal with episodes of agitation with dementia patients. There's yeah, another great question. question in the back. I noticed that you had some um, colleagues from cardiology, and I was wondering what you were doing in that area. Yeah, so, uh, well. The six minute walk. No. <laughs> um, so, the, yeah, so, so some of the people that we talk to in cardiology, um, I, I mean, some of it is making the halter monitor a lot better, <laughs> right? So instead of sort of the big box that people wear around their neck, something that somebody could wear continuously, non-invasively for an extended period. In fact, that was the motivation for that silicon dye photo that I showed you, that two lead ECG that runs off of just 19 microwatts. Um, we're part of a center that's developing those types of self-powered wearable sensing systems. And so cardiology is, is one group we're looking at, so where we can get a continuous ECG stream. One of the really interesting things, though, that we're looking at is partnerships between cardiology and some other fields. So one of, our, one of the projects that we're looking at there is um, pairing cardiology with uh, people who study pediatric asthma. And, um, and, and, and trying to actually do environmental monitoring, so like exposure to ozone and particulate matter, other types of pollutants, um, and then while at the same time doing the physiological monitoring, see what the physiological response to that kind of exposure is. So there's people from cardiology who are involved in that project as well. Hi, um, I, I wonder, have you, I guess, looked into the privacy and security implications as you're in the development life cycle, because I've worked with a number of companies that are in this space. I mean, just came across a company recently that they had a di uh, an insulin meter that could be hacked to dispose lethal doses of um, insulin because it's remote. I guess, can you talk about how you're integrating maybe security and privacy in your development process? It's an extraordinarily important question. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, people are, I, I, it amazes me that people do this, but people do hack into insulin pumps. They hack in to pacemakers. Um, and so these kinds of things are extraordinarily important. Um, so, uh, and there, so there's that security aspect of it. You want to make sure that, that, you know, that the technologies are being prevented from hacks. There's also the privacy perspective. If this data is being, you know, streaming someplace else, how can you be sure that it's not being, uh, you know, intercepted and, and used? You, you know, how can you be sure that only the people who are supposed to look at the data are looking at it? I mean, if, if you start collecting data on yourself, the next thing you know, your insurance company gets a hold of it and they raise your premiums because of what they're monitoring about you. I mean, that's a, you know, that's, that starts to get into a pretty bad business. Um, one of the things that I really try to emphasize when I talk to engineers about these kinds of things, most engineers, their answers to the security and privacy problems are mostly technical. They'll say, well, we're going to use these encryption techniques and, you know, obfuscation and all these kinds of things. And when I think what is so important for the engineers to understand is that there's a psychological and sociological aspect of it as well. So, for example, a lot of the things that we do would, you know, a lot of the applications that we target would be a lot easier if, they, if we had cameras everywhere, if we put cameras in people's homes and monitored them that way. The response we get from people is, we don't want cameras looking at us all day, every day. And you can say, well, we have this algorithm that, you know, that makes it so that it's all okay. It's like, no, a camera's still pointing <laughs> at you all day. Nobody likes that. Um, so there's sort of the psychological aspects of it as well. So, there's, so we, work with, we, we work with people who actually solve the technical side of it, who do those kinds of algorithms and cryptography and all that, but we also work with people who do human factors and sociology and try to understand what people's concerns are about these kinds of technologies. Yeah, great question. Wow, wasn't that interesting. So I have to tell you, I am in the health system development office and we're exposed to the coolest, most unbelievable information 24-7 and I did not know about this. And I work with Myla. I blame you 100% for that. <laughs> but this, I, you know, a whole new, way, whole new way to address. This is very, very exciting. Thank you all so much. It was Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>